Hello everyone and welcome back to another very exciting chess game from the chess history and in this chess game I have a very special and a very beautiful chess game to show you. So in this chess game we have Harry Nelson Pillsbury, the legend with the white pieces and we have one another very strong chess player with the black pieces and that's James Mason who is playing with the black pieces against Pillsbury. So this chess game was played in the Hastings Chess Tournament from 1895 uh, for Gary Kasparov, the strongest chess tournament of the 19th century of chess, a very large chess tournament. So all of the strongest and the most important chess players at the time competed in this Hastings Chess Tournament in 1895. So this was an interesting pairing. Pillsbury, who had the white pieces, uh, he was actually an unknown chess player but actually he shocked the world and he made a huge upset by winning this tournament and on the other hand James Mason according to many chess experts and chess metrics he was actually uh, the strongest chess player the highest rated chess player around 1877-1878 era so he was also a very strong chess player so based on his uh, accuracy, his play's accuracy, it made him, according to chess experts, the number one, the leading chess player at the time, in 1877-78. So obviously Mason was a very, very strong chess player, but this was from 1895. So let's see what happened. Harry Nelson Pillsbury starts the game with d4. We have d5 and then c4. So Queen's Gambit, Queen's Gambit declined and both players are quickly developing their pieces. There is nothing out of ordinary so far. So Rook over, D takes on C4, Bishop takes on C4. So Knight from B to D7 and both players castled Queen to E2 and Knight to D5 and also exchanging the bishops and simplifying the game, capturing the Knight and we have Pawn takes. In this position, I think bishop takes doesn't work because if bishop takes, then bishop takes after pawn takes, rook takes on c7. So already it looks like uh, in this queen's gambit declined position, uh, it looks like black has a weakness on c7. So after e takes on d5, Pillsbury played bishop to b5 and we have queen to d6 defending on c7. So in this position, uh, hoping to fix this weakness doesn't work with pushing the pawn. Then white has a very simple tactic in this position. Can you see that? And that is bishop takes knight, of course. And after queen takes bishop, white can capture the pawn. And then rook takes on c5 and white is a pawn up. So in this position, after bishop to b5, Mason has to be careful, queen to d6, and then Pillsbury is lifting the rook up. He wants to double the rooks and then attack the weakness. So c6, fixing the weakness, bishop to d3, knight to f6. And in this position, actually pushing the pawn should have been considered, but we have knight to f6, and doubling the rooks, and again, Pillsbury is exploiting the weakness. So we have rook over and then defending the pawn, but right now white has a very strong move. Can you see that move? So this is extra defense. Of course, uh, black was defending with the bishop, but Pillsbury was planning to play a very important move. And in this position, white has a very strong move. You know, it's a difficult position and defending is going to be quite tricky. But uh, this is actually quite an important moment of the game, a key moment of the game. So this is going to test your positional understanding. So can you see how should white play? Uh, there is a very simple move in this position. And that is bishop to a6. So this is what Harry Nelson Pillsbury played. So attacking the key defender, I hope you have seen this move because actually black has to capture the bishop because if not capturing the bishop then I mean let's say if going back capturing the rook so the bishop is pinned bishop takes and eliminating the key defender and landing on a6 with the queen and we can say that white has advantage 
also attacking on a7. So we have rook to c7, so black wants to double and black is also defending on a7. But in this position, queen to d7 doesn't work because of knight to e5, forking the queen and the pawn and this is also losing for black. So after bishop to a6, as you can see, a white has an advantage, but in this position, actually black has a resisting move and that move is a little bit tricky to find because you also have to see the complicated a possible continuation, the complicated variation, and that was knight to d7. And it looks like this is dropping the pawn, but then rook over, and where is the queen going? If queen to b7, then okay, white is threatening to take the pawn, but then c5, and black is threatening to trap the queen. So knight to e5 is a must in this position, so attacking the knight. And if knight takes, a, by the way, in this position, capturing the pawn is going to be a blunder because of knight takes, a, and that is going to trap the queen. Maybe white has to give up the rook. So that is losing. Basically, black has advantage. So knight to e5, knight takes, pawn takes, and queen to e6. And you can see that the, the queen is out of the play, and it is quite difficult to activate this queen. And so it is getting very complicated. So this is why Mason didn't see this. And he played rook to c7, uh, not knight to d7, which would be the most resisting move. But then knight to e5 and Pillsbury is attacking on c6. And how to defend this? We have c5. Well, if doubling the rooks in this position, uh, white has this very simple tactic. Can you see that move? It is white to move and win. Okay, so rook takes on c6 is the move. After rook takes on c6, did you see the move? Queen takes rook, of course. So after rook takes, rook takes, only defense, capturing the queen, and white is a pawn up. So after this move, we have c5, but this is also losing a pawn. Mason unfortunately couldn't extricate himself from this horrible, horrible situation. It is white to move and win again. <laughs> what would you do if you had the white pieces? Can you guess the next move of Harry Nelson Pillsbury? This is also losing a pawn. And the positionally speaking, of course, positionally speaking, black is still losing is not just losing a pawn okay Pillsbury played rook takes on c5 the b pawn is pinned of course and mason desperately captured the rook but of course if capturing the rook then queen takes queen and black can resign so c5 also doesn't work doubling the rooks was also not working and then Pillsbury simply captured the pawn because the b-pawn is pinned. So rook takes on c5, rook takes on c5, the pawn is still pinned. A very cool move by Pillsbury. Forking two pieces, but then rook to c6, knight to b8, forking queen and the rook. And this is also losing pawns. But something like this doesn't work. So there is no back rank threat because after queen to e1, queen can go back. So you can see that all of the white pieces are placed correctly. So after knight to d7, rook to c6, uh, forking queen and the rook, but this is also dropping a lot of pawns in a desperate position. Mason is trying his best, but there is not much he can do. Pillsbury captured the queen. He also captured the queen. And you can see that this d pawn is hanging. But Pillsbury played knight to c6, attacking on a7 even more accurate, activating the knight, and you can't defend this pawn, and restricting the black, black knight to jumping on b4. So we have g6, making room for the king. Actually, in this position, black has some back rank issues as well. So if rook over and defending this pawn, which doesn't make any sense, because white can capture the pawn. And if rook takes on a7, we have check mate. There is back rank issue. So 
after knight to c6 this is why giving some room for the king but still white is capturing the pawn so attacking the knight and then knight to c6 very accurate and also defending on b4 king to g7 a prophylactic move pushing the pawn and right now Pillsbury is three pawns up and how to defend the d pawn so we have rook over so if rook takes pawn then rook takes knight and Pillsbury played pawn up so of course there was back rank issue if moving the knight a uh, rook to c1 is possible Pillsbury pushed the pawn and making room for the king knight to c7 and he simply played knight to e7 forking the rook and the pawn and black is going to lose three pawns and how to defend now so rook to b8 and Pillsbury played rook to d7 well he could have captured the pawn with the knight but he preferred rook to d7 which is pretty accurate so after knight moves he then captures the pawn and the b pawn is also it looks like the b pawn is going to fall as well soon so rook over and Pillsbury captured one more pawn and this is a massacre Pillsbury has four extra pawns and this is completely losing for Mason so rook to c2 and defending the b pawn knight to g5 well Mason is trying uh, his own attack but it is quite hopeless this position is resignable 100% and Fisbury also has three extra pawns he is four pawns up so the game continued pushing the pawn the a pawn is marching pushing the pawn again after knight takes on f2 Pillsbury pushed the pawn again and after this move James Mason resigned and you can see that all of the pieces of white the rook the knight is placed very correctly very accurate play by Pillsbury so the rook is defending on a7 knight is defending on a8 you can stop this pawn so the possible continuation is going to be something like knight takes on g4 and then a7 and after rook goes behind the pawn promoting the queen and black has to give up the rook after knight takes on a8 this is all over Pillsbury is a rook up and he also has two passed pawns he's also a pawn up what an amazing chess game by Harry Nelson Pillsbury an amazing victory against James Mason so this is the final position after a6 Mason resigned and thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time. Take care and bye bye.